There could soon be a decision in the SEC's case against Ripple Labs. After two years of litigation, both sides have filed motions saying the federal judge has enough information to make a ruling without moving the case forward to a trial. The SEC sued Ripple in late 2020 on allegations that it raised more than $1 billion by selling the cryptocurrency XRP in unregistered securities transactions. Joining us now to discuss is Ripple General Counsel Stu Alarodi, welcome to the studio, Stu. Great Thank having you. you here. All right, so this is a very long awaited judgment, I would say. And it's interesting that both parties want to go to summary judgment. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, are you confident going into I imagine you are. And maybe you could illustrate the significance of this. Sure. Um, yeah, we are confident. Um, we think this is the beginning of the end of the case in terms of how the case is going to unfold. Just to level set really briefly, uh, what this case is about is whether or not an offer or sale of a digital asset is a special type of security known as an investment contract. There are no allegations of fraud in this case. There are no allegations of misrepresentation. There are no allegations of market manipulation. It really is a technical issue, and we believe it's an issue that can be resolved as a matter of law by the judge, which is why we've filed what's called a summary judgment motion, which gives the judge the opportunity to decide the issue as a matter of law and not send the case uh, to a trial for a jury, and the SEC has filed a cross motion also asking the judge to resolve the case as a matter of law. A lot of this uh, hinges on the Howey test, and you believe that XRP does not fulfill the four prongs of the Howey test. Maybe we can go into that a bit. Sure. So actually, we roll it back um, to the 1933 Securities Act, because whether or not um, the offer and sale of a digital asset needs to be registered as a security, uh, it first has to meet the definition of a security under the statute. And in fact, the Security and Exchange Commission, their authority is limited to the regulation of securities. So we believe that unless there is a contract for an investment, there's no, uh, there's no case, and actually there's no authority for the SEC to even weigh in. If they can't establish there's a contract for an investment, you don't even get to the Howey case, and we don't even believe they get to the Howey case. But if you get to the Howey case, and I think you're, most of your viewers know what that is, uh, we believe that they don't satisfy any of the prongs of the Howey case. I think it's a three-prong test, not a four-prong test, but we believe that they fail on every single prong of the Howey test. All right. Emily has a question. So, um, <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming to talk about this important case. Just to zoom out for a moment, this is very timely to be having this conversation because there's a lot of controversy about the SEC's approach to crypto, specifically regulation by enforcement, even more specifically regulation by selective enforcement, right? So as you just said, the Howey test is very confusing for a lot of people, subject to a lot of different interpretations. So my question for you is, why do you think Ripple got on the radar of the SEC in the first place? Because one could say that there are a lot of different projects that could have had this treatment. Why do you think Ripple was singled out for this kind of uh, treatment? Sure. So first, uh, first I want to agree that I, I do believe that um, this policy in the United States of regulation by enforcement is a failed policy and it's creating havoc in the marketplace and that havoc in the marketplace ultimately hurts the very retail consumer that the SEC purports to protect. I think what we're seeing is power and politics elevated over sound policy, and that is not a good thing. Uh, to your question, why Ripple? Uh, that is a good question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to it. What I will tell you is that the lawsuit was filed on December 22nd, 2020, on the last day of the prior administration when Jay Clayton was the chair of the SEC. The day after the lawsuit was filed, Jay Clayton left office, and within two weeks of the lawsuit being filed, the entire senior leadership team that was, I think, involved in the decision to file the lawsuit left the SEC. So why Ripple? I'm not really sure. I think we can all venture a bunch of different guesses. Maybe the SEC was tired of playing whack-a-mole with some smaller tokens, and they felt that um, if they could go after Ripple, 
and indirectly attack the digital asset XRP, which Ripple relies on uh, to facilitate its cross-border payments. Maybe they thought that they can send a broader message to the entire market. But I think what they've learned is uh, that if you challenge a well-resourced company, uh, that well-resourced company can put on a very robust defense and really expose the SEC that what they're doing in this case is not applying the law. It's not a faithful allegiance to the law. They're seeking to remake the law, and they don't have the power to remake the law. Only Congress can remake the law. So uh, let's step back for a second, Stu. Uh, the, the, I guess the big question here is uh, the XRP itself. So now how did Ripple get the XRP that it sold that is alleged to uh, have been securities? Where, where did it come from initially? Sure. So uh, XRP um, was created by the code when the XRP ledger uh, was um, uh uh, kind of formed or invented or released. And that was all done prior to Ripple even being formed as the company. Uh, once Ripple was formed as a company, uh, a, a certain number of XRP was gifted to Ripple. So Ripple has XRP that uh, sits on its balance sheet uh, and there's XRP that remain with the founders. But sitting here today, uh, uh, about 50% of all XRP is freely traded in the secondary market. And the total volume of XRP that is traded in the secondary market, Ripple's involvement in that trading is uh, measured in basis points, meaning it's measured in less than 1%. No percent. What, where did it come from, though, in the sense of like, if these were gifted or, or XRP was formed, uh, at a certain date, and then Ripple, the company, was formed after. Who made the decision to gift all that XRP to Ripple? Uh, the founders. The founders of? Uh, the founders of the uh, XRP ledger gifted um, XRP to Ripple, or a portion of XRP. Did they, were any members who were, who were gifting that to Ripple, the company, the same people as the founders of XRP? Um, there are, well, I'm not sure I follow that question. So in other Did words, it, it, were they gifting from one entity to another controlled by the same, by the same people? Um, there was, um, the, uh, Chris Larson was not a founder of the XRP ledger, but he was a founder of, uh, one of the founders of Ripple. Uh, and um, uh, he was involved in, um, in terms of the original gifting. Uh, there was some XRP that was gifted to Ripple. There was some XRP that was gifted to Jeb McCaleb. There was some XRP that was gifted to Chris Larson. There was some XRP that was gifted uh, but, to the third founder. And none of those people were founders of XRP. They were saying that they're totally different. They were completely separate. The founders of XRP and the founders of Ripple? Um, Jed McCaleb was no a Jed McCaleb uh, right. was a founder of uh, or again I use the word yeah. inventor I'm sure that's the wrong word I'm a lawyer I'm not a coder I'm not an engineer but he was one of the developers of the XRP ledger he was also one of the uh, uh, original right. founders of Ripple. So this case has been going on for a really long time. It's really high profile. A lot of people know about it. What has been the impact on Ripple and XRP over the past two years? Because I imagine this has, you know, drawn a lot of attention to you, maybe not in the best possible way. Yeah. So, you know, Ripple is a company and Ripple has shareholders and those shareholders have a right title and interest in Ripple. Uh, a holder of XRP has no right title or interest or claim on Ripple. So when the SEC sued Ripple in December of 2020, what happened? Uh, nearly every U.S. exchange decided to delist or suspend trading in XRP, and $15 billion in market cap uh, was erased from the XRP market. Uh, Ripple and its business and its customers essentially shifted offshore and we're a global company. We have offices in Singapore and London and Ireland and Dubai and Brazil and a bunch of other places. So our business and our customers who um, use our product and our software platform and XRP to facilitate cross-border payments, 
And that business moved offshore. Who was left hold, holding the bag? I think retail holders of XRP in the US. Um, again, the very folks that the SEC purports to protect. Just want to reverse uh, rewind a bit back to the Howey test. So my understanding it's a four prong test. It's an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of a profit to be derived from the efforts of others. And I just want to mention the uh, SEC's uh, side of things, which is that Ripple publicly touted the various steps it was taking and would take to find a use for XRP and to protect the integrity and liquidity of the XRP market. So uh, in their view, that there was an expectation of profit from folks that did invest their money in this, but would love to hear your response. Yeah. So I, that is the SEC's theory, and it's a failed theory. And it's a theory that doesn't satisfy the legal standard of the law. In the statement that you just put up, they don't identify any contract for an investment between Ripple and an XRP holder. Once XRP is sold and um, you can access XRP or purchase XRP in the secondary markets, our customers are free to purchase XRP in the secondary market or they can purchase it from us. But once the, SC once the XRP is purchased, there's no post-sale obligation. There's no promise that Ripple is making that they're going to do anything on behalf of the purchaser. So therefore, there's no contract for an investment. In terms of the SEC's theory, uh, Right, which some people think it's four prongs, some people think it's three prongs, but I think the, uh, the test you laid out is, is the correct test. Uh, but what the SEC does, and they try to do it, um, I think, uh, with a bit of a legal sleight of hand that is not going to survive scrutiny by the judge, is what you need at the core of the test is a common enterprise. And the purchaser of the asset has to be investing in a common enterprise. And what the SEC is suggesting is that a common interest is a substitute for a common enterprise, and it's not. Ripple uses XRP in its products, and our customers use XRP in our products. So we have an interest in uh, the trust and the integrity and the liquidity of XRP for our own behalf, but we've made no promise to any holder of XRP that we will take steps or we're obligated to take steps on their behalf to do those things. It's imagine if I were to sell you an, or the Andy Warhol Foundation were to sell you an Andy Warhol lithograph, and you were to buy that lithograph thinking that you can subsequently sell that at a higher price, and the foundation owns a whole bunch of other Andy Warhol lithographs, and they are out there promoting Andy Warhol and they're doing, you know, art shows, et cetera. That doesn't convert the Andy Warhol lithograph into a investment contract. What you have there, perhaps, is a common interest between the Andy Warhol Foundation and the holder of the Andy Warhol lithograph, but you don't have a common enterprise. And the other thing the law is very, very clear on, and it may sound like a, you know, uh, a lawyer you know, giving you a fine legal point, but it's an important legal point. And the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit has been very clear on this point. What Howey requires is an investment in a common enterprise, not an investment in efforts. And the quote is, you cannot so easily satisfy the Howey test by simply saying that you're investing in efforts you need to invest in a common enterprise. In other words, you need to invest in a business venture. You need to have a right title or interest in that business venture, and no holder of XRP has any right title or interest in the business venture known as Ripple. If you want a right title or interest in the business venture known Just as Ripple, you need to go out in the secondary market and buy a share of Ripple stock. So just a quick follow-up to that. Do you think there are cryptocurrencies out there that are indeed unregistered securities? And SEC Chair Gary Gensler himself has said that you don't need any further guidance. It's all written out there in case law that uh, you don't need any further explanation from the SEC. Do you? I, I imagine you don't, you don't agree with that. Well, it, it, there's two questions there. Um, uh, could there be digital assets that are packaged and sold as securities? I imagine there could be. Um, 
to what Gary Gensler says is we don't need any further clarification. Maybe that was true if the SEC under the prior leadership and the SEC under Gary Gensler's leadership was faithfully applying the law. What they're doing here is they're not applying the law, they're seeking to remake the law. The SEC has already been called out by this court by engaging in hypocrisy because uh, they are engaging in litigation behavior to further a desired result rather than a faithful allegiance to the law. So maybe I would agree with Gary Gensler that we don't need any further clarity if he was faithfully applying the law, but he's not. He's twisting the law, or the SEC is. I don't want to make this personalized to Jira Gensler. The SEC is twisting the law. They're using sleight of hand to pretend that common interest can be a common enterprise. Uh, that you don't need a contract for an investment to satisfy an investment contract. So if we were to faithfully apply the law, maybe we don't need any more clarity. But over the past six years, I'll say starting with the Clayton administration at the SEC and now continuing into the Gary Gensler administration, there's been so much confusion and havoc wrought by this agency, and I think intentionally, because with that, with confusion comes power. Uh, let me put it this way. If Gary Gensler or the SEC truly believed that they had the power that they suggest they have in speeches and interviews, they would be exercising that power, and they're not. All right. And the reason they're not is because they don't have the power under the law, and that's going to be exposed in this case. Stu, I'm being told you're running out of time, so we appreciate you coming on the show no less. Though, yes or no, any settlement on the table? We've said... Uh, publicly since day one that this case settles if the SEC makes clear that Ripple sales and distributions of XRP and XRP's trading in the secondary market does not constitute a security. If they're willing to acknowledge that, the case settles and settles very, very quickly. Without that acknowledgement, we have no choice to continue to defend the case, and we're defending the case not only on behalf of Ripple, we're really defending this case on behalf of the entire crypto industry. Because if we're not gonna get clarity through regulatory rulemaking, and we're not, we're getting deliberate um, confusion wrought upon the market. If we're not gonna get clarity through the legislative process, and there's some good faith efforts to make that work, the only other place that where you can get clarity is through the judicial process, the litigation process, and that's where we're going to get it. Stu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate Great conversation. It. That's Ripple General Counsel Stu Alderotti.